if we can have their stories shared by preaching about them, by teaching about them in our classes, by getting their artwork, like I have the artwork right here. Where is it right here? There it is. What's up and welcome to the Ask Father Josh Show, the Catholic question and answer show on the Ascension Presents YouTube channel where I attempt to respond to some of those questions that you have regarding our Catholic faith, particularly whenever our church doesn't always give us an easy fill in the blank answer to the questions that, that we have. Unlike my podcast where I answer three to five questions per episode on this show, I will only answer one question, but from the perspective of how it relates to our relationship with God how it relates to our relationship with the church and our relationship with each other. If you want to give me your questions for future episodes for me to respond to, then I want to highly encourage you to hit me up with your questions in the comment section below using the hashtag AskFatherJosh. In addition to sending me your questions for me to respond to, I would love to hear the glory stories that are happening in your life. What are those good things that you perceive our Lord doing for you in your walk toward eternity? If you want to share those glory stories with us so that we can all rejoice together, then I want to invite you to use the hashtag glory story also in the comment section below. On today's show, we're going to respond to the following question. Hashtag ask Father Josh. Is there a way I could get a list of the saints that Father mentioned in this video? This video was specifically speaking about uh, the one I did on Halloween where I mentioned a number of different holy uh, members of the body of Christ uh, throughout our church's history. I'll be honest, I was not familiar with most of those names. I like to learn more about them. I know Aquinas, Francis, and St. Martin the Porres because my birthday is on his feast day. But beyond that, there's a lot of those names that were new to me. Thank you so much for the information. Well, with that, let's get started. So uh, some, some of the members of the body of Christ who I, I mentioned on that show a few months ago, particularly the Halloween episode, uh, were not canonized saints. They uh, were, were holy um, black Catholics who are on the path to being canonized. They were servants of God, venerables, and, and some of them even, even blessed. Uh, and so in addition to the canonized saints that I've talked about on my previous shows, I particularly highlighted those servants of God, those venerable members of the body of Christ, and also those beatified members of the body of Christ as, as well. Uh, I think it's important for us to, to note that here in the United States of America, there are currently zero canonized African Americans. We have a few canonized saints, but zero canonized African Americans. We have six African Americans who are on the path to being canonized. Uh, Venerable Henri DeLille, Venerable Augustus Tolton, Venerable Pierre Toussaint, Servant of God, Mother Mary Elizabeth Lange, Servant of God Thea Bowman, and Servant of God Julia Greeley, but zero currently canonized saints. Uh, but just because we don't have any current canonized saints in the United States of America does not mean that there aren't many canonized uh, African saints or black saints of African descent from around, around the world. And, and the reason why we have uh, a number of, of black saints from around the world, some whom are, are known by many people like St. Martin de Porres and St. Joseph Mbikita and others who are not, is, is because of the great commission of, of Jesus Christ. Let's, let's go all the way back to the gospel. In the gospel, before Jesus Christ ascended into the kingdom of heaven, he gave his apostles this commission. And he said to them, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them all I've commanded you, right? The, the actual translation of the word nations in the gospel is ethnos, which means ethnicities. So before Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he told the apostles to go out and make disciples of all ethnicities. The apostles then gathered together for prayer with the Blessed Mother. And as they were in prayer together, they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And the very first thing that the apostles did whenever they received the third person of the Most Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, at Pentecost is they went out to people of every nation, people from Africa, people from Asia, and people from, from Europe, it's, it's written in Acts chapter 2. It's, it's amazing. And they went out and they spoke their languages, these people who spoke different tongues. 
and they shared with him Jesus Christ. Matthew, the tax collector, St. Matthew, he eventually went all the way to Africa where he died as he proclaimed the gospel and as he invited people in that place to come into the Catholic church that Jesus Christ invited him to as well. Very beautiful. That's where he was martyred. In addition to Matthew going there, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch also went there and shared the gospel as, as well. And the fruit, the fruit of their sharing the gospel in Africa as the other apostles went to other places in the world to share the gospel, it was supernatural. John, the beloved disciple, he writes about this fruit in the book of Revelation. He was given the grace of God to experience a vision of the kingdom of heaven. And when he saw heaven, do you know what he saw? He writes this, I see people of every race, nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping together, surrounding the throne of the Lamb of God. It's so, it's so beautiful. In the book of Revelation, John writes about this beautiful vision. But these, these, these saints in heaven, they, they were formed um, here on, on earth, and they, they're all over the world. They come from every, every part of the world. And some of these, these saints that, that some people know include people like the doctor of the church, St. Augustine, uh, and his mother, St. Monica. These are two African saints. Uh, they, they also include the martyred African saints like St. Charles Lawanga and the Ugandan martyrs. St. Perpetua and, and St. Felicity. They include married saints like Blessed Benedict Daswa. They in include uh, saints who were desert fathers and desert mothers like St. Um, Moses the Ethiopian and uh, St. Mary of Egypt. Franciscan saints like St. Benedict the Moor. Dominican saints like St. Martin the Porras and Venerable Teresa Chicaba. Like our church's calendar has so many brothers and sisters in the body of Christ who are canonized saints or they're beatified blessed. Uh, but again, there's also a number of holy black Catholics around the world who are currently servants of God and venerables uh, as well. Being that this is Black History Month, uh, I want to share with you three of my, my favorite black Catholics who are on the path to being canonized. Uh, two of them are currently beatified, they're blessed, and one of them is a venerable. The venerable is Venerable Father Augustus Tolton, uh, and then the blessed are Blessed Francisco de Paula Victor and Blessed Cyprian Michael Iwene Tanzi. And so the reason why these are three of my favorites uh, is because, well, they're, they're all priests. But I think if we reflect upon their lives, one of the common things these priests had in common was, by the grace of God, they were able to, to persevere. And, and, I, and I think that's a particular virtue that all of us need to cultivate, that, that virtue of, of a persevering in our walk toward eternity, that receiving that grace of God to persevere, that gift of the Lord as well, to cultivate that and to, to remain in that uh, in, in our own walk toward eternity as well. I'm going to share their stories with you. And then after I share their stories, I'm going to invite us to reflect upon how their stories can impact our relationship with God, our relationship with the church, and also our relationship with, with each other. So let's first examine Venerable Father Augustus Tolton. Venerable Augustus Tolton, he is from right here in the United States of America. He was born into slavery in Missouri. His, his dad, he died fighting in the Civil War. And so his mother and his siblings, his family, while he was a baby, they, they escaped slavery and they went to Illinois, which was a free state. And, and his mother wanted her family, her kids to be, to be rooted in the sacramental life of, of the Catholic Church. And so she enrolled her, her, her son, Augustus, and his siblings into a Catholic school, thinking that this would be a good environment for, for them to really grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ and in their relationship with the church. Uh, unfortunately, uh, racism was, was very real. And so he, Augustus, and his siblings experienced uh, bullying every single day from their classmates. They were called racial slurs like the N-word. Uh, it wasn't a safe place for them. And so his mother, fearing for their, their lives, she, she pulled them out of this, this Catholic school because she saw how much damage it was doing to, to their, their self-image to daily be uh, assaulted by, by their classmates. And so Augustine began to, to work, and, and after work, there were a small number of clergy and religious who discipled him, who accompanied him, who, who ministered to him and helped him to grow in his relationship with Jesus Christ in the church. One of those clergy was a, a priest, Father Peter, and Father Peter noticed there was something really special about young Augustus, and so 
he encouraged his mom, like, please, like, let him come to my parish, to my school. I think he needs a good Catholic education. There's something special about this young man. And so his mother allowed him to go to this, this school at this parish. But whenever he got there, it, it was chaotic. A lot of the parishioners at this Catholic parish, they did not want their kids to go to school with, with a black man, with a black boy. And so they, they protested and they wrote letters to the bishop saying, you need to remove Father Peter from this parish. He's an inadequate pastor. He's doing things that are dangerous for our community. We don't want this to happen in our church. They began to threaten Augustus and threaten Father Peter. Augustus came anyway. He persevered anyway. And he went to this school. And, and, and even the teachers, some of them wouldn't teach him. And so that's when the school sisters of Notre Dame stepped up to the plate. And they began to, to teach him in the classes where the other Catholic teachers would not would not educate him. And while he was in school, once again, again, he was, he was persecuted, but, but he remained. He persevered. He stayed the course. And he grew in his relationship with Jesus Christ. In the midst of his brothers and sisters in the body of Christ who were persecuting him, uh, who were not loving him well, he chose to stay close to Jesus and to the church that Jesus Christ founded. After he received his first Holy Communion, he was drawn to spend more time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And through his time with God in the Blessed Sacrament, he perceived an invitation from the Lord to pursue the priesthood. He brought this to the light, and Father Peter encouraged him. But as they began to reach out to each and every single seminary in the United States of America, and a seminary is a school where guys go to be formed into the priesthood, each and every single seminary rejected him. There was not one seminary in this country that was open to accepting a black man. Sometimes I think we wonder why there are so few black priests, um, but we forget about the history of many of our church leaders in the United States of America um, over the past few hundred years. They, they wouldn't accept a black man. And so he wasn't accepted. And so he came up against this, this stumbling block, this roadblock, and, and that could have deterred him in his relationship with the church or with Christ, but he continued to persevere. He continued to remain faithful to God every day in prayer. He continued to serve his people in his community as a catechist, and he evangelized the people in his geographical boundaries. And eventually, the priest in, in his, his circle were able to get him into a seminary in Rome. So he went all the way to Europe, and he was formed as a disciple of Jesus Christ in Rome, and he, he grew in his relationship with the church during his time in Rome, and eventually he was ordained. And after his ordination, he was sent back to the United States of America, where he came back to a place into a space where he was regularly called the N-word, not by just people out there in the community who were pagans or who weren't Catholic, but by Catholic priests. His own brother priest called him the N-word, and they told their parishioners, you, you better not go to that N-word's masses. They discouraged their people from, from being in contact with a priest. Father Augustus Tolton, even though he experienced rejection and betrayal from his own fellow clergymen, he still remained faithful to Jesus and he imitated Jesus and he prayed for them and poured himself out for his people and bore a lot of supernatural fruit in his community. But he was alone and he was exhausted and he was tired and he ended up dying very early on in his priestly ministry from the exhaustion of going, going, and going, um, pouring himself out for the sake of salvation of, of, of souls. That man, Father Augustus Tolton, is now venerable Augustus Tolton, and he is on his path to being beatified and eventually, hopefully, canonized. Another priest who, who I admire uh, is a priest from Brazil, South America. His name was Blessed Francesco de Paula Victor. This, this priest was also, like Augustus, born into slavery. And when he was a kid, at some point in his childhood, he was liberated from slavery, he was freed from slavery, and he immediately began to express his desire to be a priest. However, even though he was really excited and really happy about this perceived call he experienced in prayer with Christ, as he expressed it, some people in his community weren't as excited as he was. His boss took him out to the middle of the street and physically assaulted him to discourage him from pursuing the priesthood. He did not think that this, this young boy, because of the color of his skin, was worthy of, of being a priest. But 
Francisco continued to exclaim and proclaim to everybody that he wanted to be a priest. He told his family, his friends, he told his parish priest who accompanied him in his discernment. And eventually he was able to meet the bishop. The bishop saw there was, again, something very special about this young man. So he accepted him into the seminary. And when he came to the seminary, the seminarians, they, they assumed he was a servant because of the color of his skin. But when he told them he was a seminarian, they were like, what, you, you're a seminarian? Right? They also, like his boss before seminary, many of them rejected him. They persecuted him. But like Augustus Tolton, he persevered. He continued in his formation. Even whenever he didn't have many friends in seminary, he prayed for them. He fasted for them. He was patient. He was kind. He was gentle. He was virtuous. And his virtue began to transform many of them to, to repent for, for their sins of, of racial prejudice and discrimination. Eventually, he was ordained. He was assigned to a parish first as a proker vicar, then as a pastor. And the parish that he was assigned to, a third of the parishioners were slave owners. They still owned slaves. And now their pastor was a black man who was a former slave. They were upset. Why would the bishop send this priest to, to, to our community is what many of them thought to themselves. And not only to themselves, but then to him. They protested him. They walked out during his homilies. They refused to receive Holy Communion from him, the sacraments, the body of Jesus Christ, all because of the color of his skin. In the midst of being rejected by his bride, by the people that he was sent to serve, he didn't reject them. I had a bishop tell me many years ago, Josh, it's not so much about whether the people you're called to serve accept you, it's more so about whether or not you will accept them. And even though they rejected him, he poured himself out for them every single day through the masses he celebrated, through the divine office that he prayed for them, through the penances that he offered up for them, through the service that he extended to them, through his ministry to the poor and to the uneducated. He opened up schools for people in his community so that they could receive an academic education and grow intellectually and be able to get jobs that otherwise they weren't able to find because of what they did not have. He poured himself out for these people who, who spit upon him. And because he continued to go out of himself for their good, like his seminary classmates, many of them began to have conversions. They began to repent. They began to reform their lives. At some point, he was going to be reassigned, and the people who once hated him protested they protested against this potential reassignment and they raised enough money to, to show the bishop that he needs to stay in our community. This is our priest. He is helping us to become saints. That is the parish that he not only began his ministry, but that was also the parish where he eventually died in, transforming the hearts and minds of the people in his community through his Christ-like sacrificial love. He persevered. No matter how difficult it was, he persevered, like Augustus Tolton. The, the third black Catholic that I want to introduce us to, the third priest who I think is an inspiration to us who we can learn a lot from, especially during Black History Month, is a priest by the name of Blessed Cyprian Michael Owene Tanzi. Unlike Father Augustus Tolton and Father Francisco, he was not born into slavery. He was born into Africa. He, he converted to Catholicism when he was nine years old. Um, he began to desire the priesthood as a child. He pursued the priesthood. He flourished in seminary formation. He was ordained to the priesthood. He became a pastor. And as a pastor, he was holy. He was something like St. John Vianney. He heard confessions for many hours. He would travel from house to house throughout his communities on bike instead of in a car, which cars were available to him at his time. He refused to drive them. He used the bike instead. He wanted to, to live like the poor. He would build houses for the poor, and at the same time, he did not live in anything that was, that was nice at the time. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of sacrifice. He was a man who was present to his people. His priesthood bore so much supernatural fruit that over 70 men from his churches went on to the seminary and became priest. Over 70 vocations were attributed to his priestly witness. In the midst of bearing all this supernatural fruit, he perceived our Lord invite him to be a monk, to leave the secular priesthood and go to a monastery to be a monastic priest. The people in his community did not understand this, this vocation. They, they didn't want their priest to leave them. They encouraged him to stay, but he would not 
be persuaded by their opinions or by their thoughts or by their desires. The only one who he would choose to follow and listen to was God the Father. God's love dictated his decision to leave everything, to follow the Lord into the silence, into the solitude of the monastery. That, that's very much like, like Jesus. Jesus didn't allow the opinions of others, no matter how much he loved them, to dictate his choices that he made. He, Martha tried to tell Jesus what to do. He didn't listen to her. Peter tried to tell Jesus what to do. He didn't listen to him. The scribes and the Pharisees tried to tell Jesus what to do. He didn't listen to him. It was the Father's love that dictated every decision that Jesus Christ made in his walk toward Jerusalem, and the same applied for, for blessed Cyprian. It was the Father's love. He persevered in following the Father, where the Father wanted him to go, and he did not give in to everyone else's thoughts and ideas about his relationship with Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. Father Augustus Tolton, Father Francisco, uh, Father Cyprian, Michael, all three of these priests, what they teach us by their witness is that in the midst of difficult times, in the midst of being misunderstood by other people, in the midst of active persecution, we too can persevere in our relationship with Jesus and in our relationship with the church. Now, I want to examine how their example of perseverance can affect our relationship with God. When we think about God, there is one God, but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, he, like Father Augustus Tolton, was persecuted. He, like Father Francisco, was, was also persecuted. He was also persecuted by the people that he invested in, by his, his first priests, the apostles. At the, at the Last Supper, Jesus Christ ordained the apostles. He ordained them. And after their ordination, he told them, y'all are all going to abandon me. And, and they did. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they all abandoned him, including John. John did come back. But at one point, they all abandoned Jesus. Peter denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. Jesus Christ was abandoned. He was betrayed. He was denied. He was rejected. And what was his response? What was his response did he give up on the church? Did he give up on the apostles and say, I'm done with y'all. I'm going to go and found another church on another rock, Peter, not you anymore. I'm, I'm going to pick another group of apostles. No. After his passion, death, and resurrection, he went to the apostles and he said, peace be with you. He still called them to holiness. He still invited them to a relationship with him. He persevered with the apostles even whenever they weren't good to him, he was, he was good to them. And what, what this says is that we are made in the image of God, that we are members of the body of Christ. Therefore, we are invited to imitate Jesus Christ who abides in relationship with us like Father Augustus Tolton did, like Father Francisco did. Like they remained with Christ and the church. They did not leave Christ or the church because of the messy members of the body of Christ, the church. Now, I'm, I'm not saying in this that some of us might not be called to go to a different parish if, if our parish that we currently go to is filled with a, you know, a leadership that might be abusive towards us or if you're in a religious community where it's not healthy that you're not called to lead that religious community. But even if you lead that religious community or you walk away from that particular parish, we should not walk away from Jesus and the sacraments, Jesus or the church that he founded 2,000 years ago. We can find another parish. We can find another religious order to walk with. But we're not invited to just say, well, I'm going to give up on Jesus or the church that he founded because of the messy members of the body of Christ. Jesus didn't do it. And we're called to imitate Jesus. And since he didn't do it, neither should we. Uh, now, now, what does this teach us about, about, about the church? Well, the, the, the church is, is not just a, a nice museum for the saints. The church really is a hospital for sinners. And those sinners include the Pope and our bishops, our priests, our sisters, our nuns, our friars, our monks, our married couples, and our single people in the Catholic Church, our young people and our old people, the men and the women. We are all sinners. We, we proclaim this in the liturgy at the Mass. 
When we go to worship God at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, what's the one thing we all say together when we begin the liturgy in the Confidior? I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned. I don't look at you and say that you have sinned and you have sinned or they have sinned or she or he. I say, I have sinned. So in the church, we are all broken. We are all wounded. We are all sinners. It's, it's not them who, they're the only ones who struggle. I struggle too. I go to confession myself once a week. We are all sinners. And so we come to church together so that together we could be restored. Together we could be renewed. Together we could be reformed and transformed by the grace of, of God. This is the place where we are, we are all welcome. If you are a sinner, you belong in the church. You belong in the church. And if you stay in the church, if you stay close to the sacraments, if you stay close to Jesus, then over time, the Lord will purify you and me, purify us as he draws us to be saints. But we must persevere in our relationship with the church and every member of the body of Christ, right? No matter how messy they are. Again, this does not mean we don't put up boundaries around some members of the body of Christ who are particularly dangerous and unhealthy for us. But even those boundaries do not mean that we do not extend forgiveness, mercy, prayer, and sacrifice for them, even if that means from a distance. Now, what does this, this, this mean in our relationship with, with each other? Well, I think what this means for our relationship with each other is that we are invited to be responsible with these, these saints, some of whom are not as well known as others, these blesseds and these venerables and these servants of God. Uh, if you are a servant of God or a venerable or, or a blessed, your, your cause for canonization is open, but, but many people might not know about that. So we should first and foremost pray. We should pray for our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, that they become canonized saints so that more people can find out about them and hear their stories and be motivated and inspired by their witness of perseverance. Perseverance is in relationship with Jesus and the church that he founded, particularly with the messy members of the church, the hierarchy and the leadership and the lay people who, who weren't good to them, who were, were sinful toward them. They did not leave the sacraments. They did not leave Jesus because of the messy members, and, and neither should we. I really do believe that their stories will inspire us to also not give up, to never give up. We can also raise money because, to be honest, when it comes to the cause of canonization, that costs money. And so we can raise money and we can tie it toward the, the causes for, for the different people who are servants of God, who are venerables, who are blessed, so that their cause can continue to move forward so that more people around the world can hear their stories and come to know them, be in relationship with them, and be drawn by them to him, to Jesus Christ, on earth and forever in the kingdom of heaven. So there, there are members of the body of Christ in the Catholic Church uh, who are from Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, North America, all over. And I think it's important for us to get to know all of them. But particularly for Black History Month, I think it might be really special if we could dedicate each day to getting to know one of these many members of the body of Christ uh, of African descent um, who, who desire, who desire to accompany us, to pray for us, uh, to walk with us to Jesus on earth uh, and, and to stay with us and remain with us with Jesus forever in the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. With that being said, let's jump into our glory story. All right, Glory Story this week comes in from Freya. Freya writes this, Glory Story. I was born in a Catholic family, but I knew nothing. My family members are not devout Catholics. Then I met this guy in the most perfect time of my life. And he teached me all these things that I wish I knew earlier. He helped me to walk with God. He helped me to see how good God is. I believe God put him in my life for a purpose. And now we do rosaries together every day. We discuss certain topics to strengthen our faith. We read the Bible. We do our very best to follow God. And now I try to influence my family to come back to the church. Hope everyone who is struggling with their faith, like me before, may find someone or something that will help them to walk with God. God bless you all. Yeah, Freya, I, I, I praise God that, that you have someone that is being a bridge for you in this season of your life and your relationship with Jesus Christ and, and the church. 
And so let, let's pray that the Lord will continue to send more people into your community and to your family's lives so that they can also be bridges for them to come to the Lord, particularly uh, some of these servants of God, venerables, blessed, and, and saints who we talked about in today's show. With that, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, we bless you, and we adore you. We worship you, God. We thank you for the gift, for the gift of the body of Christ, for the gift of the church, for the gift of your saints, whose witness inspires us and motivates us to, to not settle for mediocrity, to not give up, but to persevere by your grace, uh, but, to, but to persevere in our relationship, God, with you, um, with our church, and with, with, with each other. God, we, we desire, we desire to, to join our brothers and sisters who have persevered by your grace and are experiencing your beatific vision. We desire to, to be with, with them where they are. Where they are is with you, and where you are, God, is where we want to be. We ask this prayer, Heavenly Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All you holy men and women, pray for us. God bless. <laughs>